talking about the activity of Tuesday, where we had to do the currency conversion. All right? And I'm going to start by asking a question. And please answer honestly. There's no points to be given out for right or wrong answer. I'm just asking a question. When you found out you had an exercise to do, what was the first thing that you did? Okay. Open up Visual Studio, created a form, made the inputs. Anyone else have a different answer? Yes. Search the web for existing scripts that are comparable to what I'm looking for. Okay. Yes. I went and did the form, did the class, and started figuring out how I was going to put the code together to actually do the. Okay. Anyone else take a different approach? All right. Seems to me there's two. Well, I don't know. I guess you could throw in, you know, grab a cup of coffee as a, as an option. But it seems to me there's two main uh, answers that you're going to have. You're either going to start programming or think about programming. All right. Now this is a this is a chance for me to go and talk about how it was in the good old days and reminisce. How many of you have ever used these before? Punch cards. All right. If, how many of you have like heard of them? You know, much in the same way that you, you've heard of dinosaurs and uh, that sort of thing, right? What are these? These are punch cards. And they have 80 columns in them. And you would punch your instructions using a key punch machine that actually physically punched holes in the card. All right? So what's wrong? What, what, what's the, what's the, the problem with that? You, you punch a wrong hole, right, and the card is ruined. You've got to chuck it and get rid of it. Now, there are tricks that you could do to make it easier. I actually, when I, when I first started taking programming courses in high school, I actually was, I actually figured out how the complicated key punch machine worked. The complicated key punch machine wouldn't punch the hole immediately. It essentially would have an 80-character buffer. All right. So you would type in what you wanted and then press print and then it would punch the holes. The nice thing is, is if I hit X and it's like, oh, wait a minute, I meant to hit Y, I could hit the backspace and type in Y and it hadn't punched the hole yet. It would just change it in the buffer. So that was good. Also got good at duplicating cards. So for example, if you had some instructions that were the same, Rather than retyping them in, you would duplicate and then maybe change from a certain point on or if you made a mistake or whatever. So we punched these, card, we punched these cards, and it was a pain to do that. Right, it was very difficult. Then we'd take these cards, and this would be a small program. You know, bigger programs would be you know, this big. But we'd take these cards and plop them in a card reader, a right, little bin, that would read through the card sequentially. And sometime later, you would get your results. Now, sometime later, when I was at Cleveland State, depending on the time of the semester that you were talking, all right? If you went the first day of the semester and you're a real go-getter and you started working on your first assignment the first day that it was assigned and no one else was in the lab, sometime later might be 20 minutes later. So I'd put my cards in, you know, uh, run it through, maybe go to the bathroom, grab a, a, a drink, come back. All right, there they would file uh, based on your student number or social security number or something in a little bin, your last couple digits. So that it was, they had 100 bins, 0 through 99. And you'd go in, and in, in the right bin was your printout. And, you know, you'd look at the last two digits of your student number, you'd find the printout, you'd look, and you'd realize, oh, I forgot a period in column 73. Oh, so what am I going to do? So I go, punch a new card, run it. By that time, maybe more students have gotten in, and maybe it'll be a half hour later. Well, as you can imagine, throughout the semester, there were like
like peaks and valleys of the response time, right? You know, assignments in computer classes tend to be on like a one to two week interval, you know? Like we had programming assignments that were due maybe every couple of weeks. And it's probably similar to what we have in this class, right? It's, probably, it's like a tradition, right? A couple of weeks seems to be about the right amount of time. And like at the beginning of that two week cycle, the lab was dead. And as the deadline approached, then the lab would become busy. And the turnaround time then would go up from uh, 20 minutes, which would be like the absolute best case scenario, to an hour, which wasn't bad, a couple hours, three hours. Towards the end of the semester, when everyone was working on their final projects and programs and, and turning in late stuff and, oh boy, I better open the book because it's week seven in the quarter, all right, um, then the turnaround time would be as long as overnight. Which means that you would submit it today, let's say I do it now, 10, 30 in the morning, all right, it wouldn't be ready till sometime tomorrow morning, all right? I would, you know, I'd submit it. Typically what I'd do is I used to take the bus, so I'd submit it before I went home, all right? Go home, come in, first thing when I got to school, go and look in the bin, find my output, only to realize I forgot a period in column 63 this time, all right? And it's like, oh. So you correct that and the cycle begins. And I won't know if I got it right again until the next day. All right? What is the point of this story? Is the point of this story to tell you how you kids these days have it lucky? <laughs> we didn't have cell phones when I was growing up. We didn't have video games. We played with rocks and sticks. That's what we had. You wanted a phone, you grab a stick and pretended it was a phone. You know? Phones, phones, nothing. Telegraphs, right? Yes. Wouldn't it be you grabbed a stick and threw it at someone? <laughs> it depends on the person, I suppose. All right. The point of this story is, guess what we got good at writing programs in that mode? Pardon me? Thinking before you started. Thinking before you started to code. Looking before you leave. There was none of this, mm, I'll take a shot at this. <laughs> and see if it works. Because that was a very expensive proposition. That could cost you a day's worth of time on an assignment that might be due within a few days. All right? Very expensive process. So the point is, as we thought about programming, and we drew flow charts, you know, that to diagram the process, that it starts here, you do this, you do this, You have a condition, maybe you loop back, maybe you exit, whatever. We drew flowcharts like this. Or we wrote pseudocode. Pseudocode is where you don't actually use programming instructions, but you, you write out, you know, in more English-like statements what you're going to do. We even had coding forms where you would take and write out your program before it and would do something that I later termed uh, found out the term was called desk check, your program, all right? Um, we, uh, uh, when I had, and again, I had uh, Mr. Gresh in high school, all right? Mr. Gresh is an adjunct here these days, and he was my high school computer teacher. And he didn't call it desk checking, he said play computer. You gotta play computer. So you look at the first instruction, if it said x equals zero, you'd write on a little sheet of paper x, Zero. That was your memory. All right, the next statement. X equals X plus five. You take the value of X, add five to it, cross out the zero, put a five in X, and so on. That process is called desk checking. So we went through and we checked our code, and we, were, we would be reasonably sure, or we would hope that we were reasonably sure, that it would work or come close to working before we would even try submitting it, because that's how it was back then. Now, no one in their right mind would want those days back, all right? So don't misunderstand me. But the lesson...
lesson that we can learn, and I think really is what's missing as students become used to using all the wonderful tools that are available, is that they think that they can just sort of hack their way to a solution. Not hacking as in, you know, um, you know uh, illegal hacking or whatever, but, but just sort of meander their way to a solution. It'd be like saying, um, gee, I want to go to New York City, so, well, it is, you know, I want to get there in a hurry, so I'm just going to get my car and start driving, all right? So I'm knowing where, how to get there, you know, the directions. Uh, maybe I have a vague idea. It's east, all right? So I'll head east, you know. Well, you know, that only takes you so far, and that can actually is one of them hurry up and wait situations, you know. You, you hurry up and you end up uh, taking longer than had you stopped and planned it. So, my discussion today is going to be about planning this. So we're going to run through the exercise we're going to plan it. Yes. Oh, I thought you had your hand raised. No. Okay. So we're going, to, we're going to talk about this and we're going to plan it. And the assignment on Thursday, the exercise Thursday, was to write a class or create a class that did currency conversions. And I mentioned that we were just going to convert between three currencies. All right, pounds, euros, and U.S. dollars. That being said, keeping in mind our goal is maintainability, all right, it's reasonable to think of how this could be extended. Maybe we add other currencies to it. Closely associated with the, with, uh, the term maintainability is the term scalability, all right? You often hear a discussion, does this solution scale or not? And what that means is, when the problem gets bigger, what happens to the solution? Does it get bigger, or does it stay about the same size? All right. Does it break when it gets too big? All right. We'll keep that in mind later on. Now, let's think about what we're going to have. We know we want to form. We know we want a drop down, probably two drop downs. Sort of the from currency and the to currency. So to convert from dollars to pounds, dollars to uh, euros, euros to pounds, whatever. We have a text box to enter in the quantity, and then we're going to have a label for the results, and probably a button to go. So that's my scatter design of the user interface. Now again, for this particular uh, assignment, I didn't care too much about how you made it look, all right, because we had a limited amount of time, etc. But I think this is a nifty way because if you look at it, it'll say like one dollar, you know, is 0.7 euros or something like that. It'd be nice and user friendly for, for the users to see that. So we're going to go with, with this kind of layout. Again, when we talk about design, there's design all over the place. There's design in terms of designing a user interface and what would be the most effective user interface. That's really not what this class is about, although we should be aware of that and pay attention to it. All right, so I'll probably give at least lip service to that, even though we're not going to necessarily spend tons of time getting the perfect interface. That doesn't mean that you don't spend some time on your assignments getting it perfect, but just in the interest of, of time, I won't emphasize that in class. All right, now, we know we want a class to calculate currency conversions. All right? Now, we know that we want, we, we know a principle that we talked about in what makes for a good class is this, we, if you will, we can call our business logic. This is our user interface logic. We know that we want these to be loosely coupled. All right. 
We know we want this to be loosely coupled. All right? What does that mean? It means this should know a lot about the currency conversion. It should be a black box. By the same token, the currency conversion shouldn't know about the form or what's going to be on the form or the fact that there's a text box and labels and drop downs. Who knows? There might be radio buttons next time instead of a drop down. This could be used in a bunch of different places. All right. So we want it loosely coupled. In other words, we want these to really work independently of each other, to be sort of standalone, but to communicate with each other. All right. How do things communicate with classes or objects? Based on method calls, based on function calls. All right. Now, minimally, I would say, to design this, we would want to think of the signature of this function. All right? Because it's through the function that the user interface is going to communicate with this business logic. Actually, strictly speaking, our code behind file is going to use this function to sort of tie the form and the business logic together. So a minimum of planning would be to identify the uh, signature of the function. And by signature, I mean what the function requires and what the function is going to return. Because let's think of roles here. All right? It's the user interfaces function to supply the inputs to the function, to the business function. It's also the user interfaces job to take the output from the function and do something with it. It's the function's job to take the input do whatever it needs to do, and come up with the output. All right? So, minimally, we want to describe the, the, the signature of that function, the convert function. All right? And what would the signature of that convert function be? What are we going to pass it? What are we going to get back? An amount of dollars to convert. Okay. So, one of the arguments is, the, well, the amount of... Uh, amount of currency to convert. What's another argument? From. Yeah, the currency, we'll call it the from currency. Another argument? To. to currency. Other arguments? Not really, that's all we need to do. One dollar, we have one dollar, what is it in euros? We have 50 pounds, what is that in dollars? and so on. What is this going to return? It's going to return also an amount of currency. And the two currency, you know, in the two currency units. So that's the signature of the function. And minimally, that's what we should come up with in designing this code. All right? We're not in the land of punch cards, so we don't have to get our coding sheets out. They have 80 little columns in it and write the letters in so that we get the periods in the right place. All right. We can look and we can see, yeah, this user interface has all the ingredients. It has the quantity, the from, and the to. This code behind, yeah, we, we, we're reasonably confident we can pluck out the values of each of those and put it in. Um, and call the function and do something with the result and put it back. So we don't need to design that. I'm not a fanatic here. All right. As far as this goes, we minimally want to, want to cover the signature. And we can do one of two things. We can either accept on faith that we'll be able to figure out the details of the function and figure that out later. Or we can spend a little more time thinking about it. Well, it never hurts to spend a little more time thinking about it, so that's what we're going to do now. So this currency convert function. Let me go and pull up the chart so we have some numbers here. I'm 
not sure if this is the exact one that I used last time. It isn't. Okay, we'll only write down um, we'll write down off to the side the basic ones, which are USD, British pound, and euro. And take to two decimal points. a chart. Now, in a real application that did this, they'd have a database somewhere, or they'd have a web service, or they'd have something that would return these values. All right, we haven't gotten that far yet, so we're just going to we're just going to code these values in there, knowing that, you know, gee, if we've done a good job separating our code, all right, and we've done a good job, in and our UI is not coupled to the business logic then we can change some of the details of the business logic, namely grab those values from a database without harming much of anything because it's all as a black box, it's self-contained. What we do in that black box doesn't influence the outside world except through the arguments and the return value. Okay, so I could do something like this if From currency, equals to currency, to get a wise guy that's trying to convert dollars to dollars, all right, then, then what? To amount equals from amount. Can we agree upon that? All right. So if you're converting from dollars to dollars, pounds to pounds, euros to euros, there's no conversion. It's just the answer is whatever you input it in. So we could write a chart then that said if from equals USD and Two equals GDP, then two amount equals from amount times point six five. Right? So <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you're not actually coding, so never mind. You're, just, you're still just laying it out. Okay. There. You can ask now if you want. Oh, I, the, the question would basically be in order to keep it out of, keep
keep the point six five out of the logic and denote yeah. a variable at the top, so you just have yeah, to exactly, okay. exactly. But we'll, we'll we'll see. We might even do better than that. Okay. All right. All right. Then would say if from USD and two equals euro, then to amount equals from amount times 0.74. Okay, so that took care of the dollar conversion, right? We would similarly have two more if statements for pounds, if the from was pounds, and two more if statements if the from was euros. What's wrong with this picture? Or put differently, what does this not do? What does this solution not do? Allow for easy changeability of amount, the, the multiplier? No, nah, we'll do what you set up there, okay. and, and we'll populate values there. It uh, doesn't allow for other currencies to be in. Yeah, and, and the word that I used earlier today is it doesn't scale. So, for these three currencies, this could be manageable code. It could be. Six if statements, well, that's kind of a lot, but yeah, it's not that many, it's not 100. What if we started adding in other currencies? All right, if we have, let's see. I'm not gonna do the math. This is a permutation com combination or something problem. But I think you can see that if we add more and more currencies, it's going to like exponentially increase. So if we had 10 currencies, there's going to be a lot of if statements there. All right, it's going to be a lot of if statements. So this doesn't scale. So what could we do instead? Well, what's more, besides that, what's more is we have the potential for inconsistency, right? Like for example, the, the conversion from dollars to pounds is 0.65. What should the conversion from pounds to dollars be? This math I can do. It's going to be 1 over 0.65. I'll bet you that's what this value is. 1 over 0.65. So you know what? I have that actually in two places to, to answer your question. And that makes it harder still. So. What can we do? How can we get around this issue of scalability? What's an approach that we can take? Now, no one's going to jump out and tell you this. All right? This is just a case of solving this like a problem. What's the simplest way that I can write this that's going to mean the least work for me? All right? Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of a cure. Uh, an ounce of planning is worth a pound of programming. All right? What's the least, well, what's the simplest way we could do to, to get this? Pull out the database. If we pull out the database, we still just have numbers. And we'd still have a million if statements if we were converting yeah. a dozen different currencies. All that that's changing is where we're getting the values from. You want to you wanna make your, you want one set of if statements and make your currency type and currency two changeable. through a function of okay. changeable? That's always a good answer, by the way. When in doubt,